Hello, in this video we're going to look at derivative rules part 4. And in particular we're going to find the derivative of e to the x divided by x. Now in the last video I gave you this as a problem and hopefully you've given it a try. Even if you haven't, you could have taken a guess and said maybe this will be e to the x divided by 1. Because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of x is 1. If there's division here, maybe there's division there. Maybe the derivative of a quotient is the quotient of the derivatives. But I don't think that's the case. And so what we're going to do is see if we can use a limit to come up with the proper answer. So we do the limit. h approaches 0 of e to the x plus h over x plus h minus e to the x over x. And then we have to divide the whole thing by h. Now, like I mentioned in the previous video, the way you go ahead and work on this is we should multiply by x here, multiply by x plus h over here to get ourselves a nice common denominator. So that'll be x e to the x plus h minus e to the x x plus h over x plus h times x and the other h because it's division you can sneak that on up into the denominator right there. Now we're going to go ahead and expand and factor and see what we can come up with. So we'll get the limit h approaches 0. This will be x e to the x plus h minus x e to the x minus h e to the x over x plus h, x, h. We definitely want to split up that e to the x plus h business. This we should split up into e to the x, e to the h. So we can go ahead and do that. Limit h approaches 0 of x, e to the x, e to the h, minus x, e to the x, minus h, e to the x, over x plus h, x, h. Notice we've got the e to the x in common with all three terms, so we can factor that on out. So we'll get that all the way out of the limit. Because, of course, it is a constant. There's no h with it. So we have x e to the h minus x minus h over x plus h times x times h. Now, from here, there's not really anything that factors, although you could say maybe an x factors from just these two terms. That's definitely an option. And so if we do that, we get e to the x, limit h approaches 0, x, e to the h minus 1, minus h. So x plus h, x, and then h. Now at this point here, it's honestly probably a good idea to work on the e as the limit definition. So if you remember, e is equal to the limit h approaches 0 of 1 plus h to the 1 over h. And because we have e to the h, we could go ahead and work with an h power right away. So it would be 1 plus h to the 1 over h, and then you'd raise that whole thing to the power of h. Well, if you remember for exponent rules, when you have power to a power, you multiply. So 1 plus h times h, so that'll be h over h. So let's just limit h approaches 0 of, well, just 1 plus h, because it'll be to the power of 1. So let's go ahead and replace e to the h, which is right here, with this portion right here. That's going to give us e to the x, limit h approaches 0 of x, 1 plus h minus 1, minus h over x plus h times xh. All right. We could simplify inside here. There's a plus 1 and a minus 1. Those will cancel out e to the x, limit h approaches 0 of x times h minus h over x plus h times x times h again. Now there's going to be 
an h in common in that numerator. So we factor out the h and we get x minus 1. And there's that h that we've been needing to cancel all along. That's great news for us because now, and again, once you cancel that h on the bottom, that's kind of the key that unlocks your limit. You should be good to go now in terms of plugging it in. So if you notice, you've got an h on the bottom, sure, but it's x plus h. So that will just become x plus 0. And there's no other h's here to plug in, so we're pretty much there. This gives us e to the x times x minus 1 over x times x, which we could write as e to the x times x minus e to the x over x squared. Now, just for uh, the structure of this, it's nicer to write it as x e to the x minus e to the x over x squared, but it means the same thing. And there is our derivative. Now, if you notice, this is definitely not e to the x over 1. This is much more complicated, and there's clearly something going on here, some type of rule or pattern. But it's, again, not entirely obvious what that structure is. We need a little bit more information if we're going to come up with this rule. Now, you actually did a quotient question on your assignment. So this is from the assignment that you did. You found the derivative of x plus 5 over x minus 3, and it became negative 8 over x minus 3 squared. So here we have a piece of information, and we also have the piece of information that the derivative of e to the x over x is equal to x e to the x minus e to the x over x squared. So pause the video and see if you can come up with a rule. Where does this 8 come from on the top? How is that related to this? Why is there an x minus 3 squared or an x squared? What's going on? See if you can come up with a rule. So hopefully you gave this a try. And again, I don't want to spoil it for you, so please make sure you give this a really good effort trying to come up with a rule. But the rule that's here, the quotient rule, is as follows. You take the denominator and you square it. That should be obvious from this one and this one. But the numerator is trickier. If you notice, it's kind of like a, kind of like a product rule in that there's going to be two terms. But it's going to be subtraction because, well, it's quotients. And you can think division is sometimes related to subtraction. There's a little bit of logic there. And what will help is if we add a 1 on the top here. If we put a number 1 there, you can start to see the structure. If you look here, x is just the x. And this e to the x, you can think of this as the derivative of e to the x. Then you subtract. You write e to the x again. And this 1 is the derivative of x. It's almost like you're doing the derivative of 1, leave the other alone, derivative of the other one, leave the first one alone, and then you put a subtraction in the middle. Very similar, very similar to the product rule. Let's see if that works on this one here. So if you do the first one and leave it all alone, but then do the derivative of the other one, like here we have the bottom being left alone but doing the derivative of the top. If we leave the bottom alone, we get x minus 3, and the derivative of the top is a 1. Subtract, then we leave the top alone, we do the derivative of the bottom, which is also 1. Well, does it work out? Does it give us what we expect? If we expand the times 1, we're going to get x minus 3. Then we're going to get subtract x, subtract 5, over x minus 3 squared. Well, you can cancel out the x's right here. And you're left, of course, with negative 8 over x minus 3 squared. So it checks out. This answer up here is the same as this answer over here. It seems like our rule is working. So we're going to go ahead and try this rule out on a few examples. Here we have some derivatives, and so I encourage you to try the rule here. Uh, so go ahead and, well, first I'll teach you the song, and then you can pause the video. Because the rule is, well, a little tricky. If you were to write out the rule, there's a, a denominator and a numerator, and you're doing derivatives of each one, and well, it's, it's just hard to keep track of. But there's this beautiful song that was taught to me by my calculus teacher, and so I'm going to teach it to you. The way you do the quotient rule is as follows. You do 
low d high less high d low over the denominator squared we go. So there's your song, low d high less high d low over the denominator squared we go. Let's see if we can sing that song with the first example here. So low of course means the denominator, the lower part of the fraction. So low d high means the derivative of the high, the derivative of e to the x, which is just e to the x. Less means subtraction, high d low over the denominator squared we go. Okay, well it looks like that rule is working great. Go ahead and try it on the following examples. So pause the video and give them a try. So I'm assuming you gave these a try. Let's go ahead and sing the song. Low d high less high d low over the denominator squared we go. And again for the next one. Low d high less high d low over the denominator squared we go. As long as you can sing the song, you can do the quotient rule. Now again, you have to be careful when you're doing these. When you have derivatives, right, the derivatives of a constant are zero, you have to use your power rules, and it's important that you put brackets around each one of these terms. But the rest of it is kind of fun. I like doing quotient rule. For this one, we're going to have x plus 1 times 1 minus x plus 3 times 1 over x plus 1 squared. For this one, we would get x squared, 3e to the x, subtract 3e to the x, 2x, over x squared, and don't forget to square it. Finally, we have one more to go here. We'll get 6e to the x, 2.1x to the 1.1, plus 7. And then x to the 2.1, plus 7x, times 6e to the x, over 6e to the x, all squared. So the quotient rule, written out nicely, is our rule number 7, and it's as follows. The derivative of fx over gx is gx d dx of fx minus fx d dx of gx over g of x squared. So we'll go ahead and look at the proof, and just like before, it's got that little note that we have to make initially. So just a note. Since g of x is differentiable, since g of x is differentiable, it is continuous, and the limit as h approaches 0 of g of x plus h equals g of x. So let's get on with the rest of the proof. So we start with the derivative of fx over gx, which we can use our limit definition. The limit h approaches 0, fx plus h over gx plus h minus fx over gx all over h. Now again, like in our problem solving approach, we should probably make the denominators common. So this one needs a gx, this one needs a gx, this one needs a gx plus h, this one needs a gx plus h, and that h is going to sneak up into the denominator. So that's going to give us the following. The limit, h approaches 0 fx plus h gx minus fx gx plus h 
over gx plus h, gx, and we'll sneak that h up into the denominator. Again, it's unfortunate. There's not really anything that can factor or move around in that numerator. There's not enough, really, room, not enough we can do. And so we need to do the same technique as on the product rule proof. We need to add and subtract a quantity. And in this case, the quantity we're going to add and subtract is going to be fx times gx. So we have our initial section here, and then we go ahead and add fx gx and subtract fx gx. Okay, this is still going to be all over gx plus h, gx with an h. Now this denominator, at least the gx plus h and the gx, is just really, uh, it's kind of messy, it's kind of messing some things up. So I'm going to move that out in front and just put it as a 1 over. I'm also going to rearrange some of this stuff. It looks like there's a fx plus h gx, and I'm going to put that with a minus fx gx so I can factor out the gx's. So this term I'm going to put next to this one, and then I'll leave these two next to each other. So rewriting will look as follows. Limit h approaches 0. I'm going to put 1 over gx plus h gx. I'm just going to put that out in front. Then I'm going to put fx plus h gx minus fx gx minus fx gx plus h. And then I guess I can put them plus fx gx. And this portion is now going to be over h. Well, like before, we want to look for things that could factor. Here there's a gx in common. We'll factor that out. Here there's a negative fx in common. We'll factor that out. So we get the limit. So h approaches 0 gx plus h, gx. Then we'll factor out the gx here, leaving us with fx plus h minus fx. Here we'll factor out the negative fx, leaving us with gx plus h minus gx all over h. You can probably see where this is going. We're going to group this portion over h and then this portion over h because we're trying to create the definition of the limit. Well, the definition of the derivative, I should say. So we get the limit. h approaches 0. gx plus h, gx. gx fx plus h minus fx over h. Probably should put this part in brackets too. Minus fx. And then we have our gx plus h minus gx over h. All right, well, we're close. We're very, very close to our final answer. If you notice, this is looking like a derivative of f. This is looking like the derivative of g. These are both going to be constants with the limit. And because of our note, this is just going to give us a gx and another gx. So we just have to split this all up as limits. Remember, the limit of a product is the product of the limits. The limit of a difference is the difference of the limits. All these can get their own limit in front of them. So let's go ahead and write that. It's going to take up a lot of space here, but we'll do each one having its own limit. So limit h approaches 0, 1 over gx plus h, gx, times limit h approaches 0 of gx, times limit h approaches 0, fx plus h minus fx over h. Probably should put some big brackets here because that portion 
of 1 over is in front of the whole thing. Then we can put subtraction, limit h approaches 0 of fx, and finally times the limit h approaches 0, gx plus h minus gx over h. So we're almost there, we're almost at the proof, the final part of the proof, which is to evaluate each one of these limits. So this is 1 over gx times gx. This is going to give us gx. This is going to give us f prime x minus, we'll get an fx and then a g prime x at the end. Oh, and I forgot a bracket here. We should probably put our bracket at the very end there. So this is minus fx g prime x. Close off our bracket. And to make it look like the quotient rule that we have above, we write it as gx f prime x minus fx g prime x over g of x all squared. And there is our proof. So a lot of work to prove the quotient rule, but now that it has been proved, we can use it whenever we want. It's important to note here that the reason why you get the gx squared, and I think this is quite remarkable, you might have wondered why the denominator is squared in all of the rules. Why do we have the denominator squared? Is it just because that's how the song goes? Well, not quite. We get a denominator squared because in that very first step, we have gx, which becomes a gx plus h and a gx. And we have to make the denominator common. It's that common denominator business that's so crucial to fractions that goes way back to the early days of learning fractions. That's what creates two g's in the denominator and ultimately what gives you your g squared. So I think it's kind of neat to see how a common denominator business from basic fractions is actually generating the denominator squared in the quotient rule. It's kind of neat to see. Now we're going to go ahead and do some challenge problems. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can come up with the answer to these two problems. So let's go ahead and give these a try. We start by singing the song low, which is 7 plus 2x. D high, so 6x plus 5. Less high. 3x squared plus 5x minus 7. D low, which is 2. Over the denominator squared we go. Let's do another one. Low. D high. Less high. D low. Over the denominator squared we go. Here's two more for you to give a try. Go ahead and pause the video and try these ones. All right, assuming you give these a try, 7e to the x, 12x cubed, minus 3x to the 4, 7e to the x, over 7e to the x squared. And for this one, well, when we do low d high, d high actually requires us to do a product rule because that's x squared times e to the x. So we get 2x e to the x plus x squared e to the x. So there's a product rule, product rule inside the quotient rule. That's definitely something that can happen, so watch out for that. Less high d low over the denominator squared we go. We'll do a few more problems here to make sure we're good to go. Here's one with tangent lines. So let's find equations of tangent lines to the curve here that are parallel to this curve over here. Well, to find tangent lines, we need to have a point and a slope. Let's look at that slope first. So to find the slope, we should find y prime. So low d high less high d low, over the denominator squared we go. We're going to want to simplify this because we're actually going to want to do stuff with it. So we'll get 
x plus 1 minus x, and then again plus 1, because negative negative will make a positive. The x's cancel out here, and so we get 2 over x plus 1 squared. Now we're going to need to plug something in for this to find our actual slope, so we should probably find that point we're talking about. To find the point, well it says this tangent line should be parallel to this line. Parallel means here, same slope. Okay, well, what is the slope of this line over here? Well, we could rewrite this as 2y equals, if we move the y to the right-hand side, we have 2y equals x minus 2, or y equals x over 2 minus 2 over 2. So putting it into y equals mx plus b form would tell you that it has here a slope of 1 half. Okay, so if it's got a slope of 1 half, and we're supposed to have the same slope, then the tangent line should also have a slope of 1 half. Okay, well, what does that mean? How do we make sure the tangent line has a slope of 1 half? Well, the, this right here is the slope of the tangent line. And we want the slope of the tangent line to be 1 half. So let's go ahead and set the slope of the tangent line, which is 2 over x plus 1 squared, equal to 1 half. Oh, well, that looks like we can then solve for x and get a whole bunch of in interesting information. So we'll go ahead and continue on with that over here. We'll cross multiply to give us 4 equals x plus 1 squared. You can solve this a number of ways. I'm going to go ahead and just expand everything. So this will be x squared plus 2x plus 1. 0 equals x squared plus 2x minus 3. 0 equals x plus 3 x minus 1, so x is equal to negative 3, and x is equal to 1. So those are our two points. Well, half of the point, we only have the x values. So we'll need to take those and find the y value. So for this one here, y would be equal to negative 3 subtract 1 over negative 3 plus 1. We're plugging it in, of course, into this formula up here. And so that'll give y equal to negative 4 over negative 2, which will be 2. Over here we'll get y equals 1 minus 1 over 1 plus 1, which means y will be equal to 0. So we can combine all that information and write down our tangent lines. So that'll give us y minus 2 equals 1 half x plus 3 and y minus 0 equals 1 half x minus 1. Those are the two tangent lines. Now we'll go ahead and show this on Desmos just to confirm that we did indeed find the correct values. So here we have our graph, y equals x minus 1 over x plus 1. Interestingly, you can see how there's a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 1 and a horizontal asymptote at 1 using your pre-cal knowledge. So we go ahead and turn on the two lines, and we can see, yep, those are both tangent lines. And indeed, if I was to type in the line y, or x minus 2y equals to 2, you would see that these two tangent lines are indeed parallel to that third line. So all the information lines up, and it looks pretty cool on the graph. Now let's go ahead and do another example, this time looking at the product and quotient and derivative rules, but without any functions to look at. So we're going to be told f of 3 is 4, g of 3 is 2, f prime of 3 is negative 6, g prime of 3 is 5. So let's find f plus g prime of 3. And what that means is we have to use our rule, which says that when you're doing addition, you find just each prime on its own. So f prime 3 plus g prime 3, which is equal to negative 6 plus 5, which is equal to negative 1. For b, we have to find f g prime of 3, which means, well, we don't just prime each one. We prime the first one, and then the second one gets left alone. 
Then we leave the first one alone as just an f, and we prime the second one. So based on the information we have, f prime is negative 6. g, just simply g of 3 is 2. f of 3 is 4. And g prime of 3 is 5. So plugging that all in, we have 12, negative 12 plus 20, which is 8. All right, go ahead and try question C on your own. Pause the video and see what you come up with with f over g prime at 3. All right, so assuming you gave this one a try, we would have f over g prime of 3 is equal to low d high less high d low over the denominator squared we go. And from here it's simple substitution. So this is going to give us 2 times negative 6 minus 4 times 5 over 2 squared. And so you work on that, do a little bit of arithmetic, and you get negative 12 minus 20 over 4, or simply negative 32 over 4, which can reduce to negative 8. Now I want you to try question D. In this case, we have f over f minus g prime of 3. So you've got to do the quotient rule. But as you do the quotient rule, you also have to watch out for doing the derivative of a difference. A lot to keep track of there. See what you come up with for D. So assuming you gave that a try, we're going to need a lot of space down here. Let's go ahead and try D. So we have f over f minus g prime at 3. So low d high f prime of 3 less high f of 3 d low f minus g prime of 3 over the denominator f minus g of 3 squared. Now, f minus g of 3, that means we just find f of 3 and g of 3. So f of 3, and then we subtract g of 3. f prime of 3 minus f of 3. And then here, we know that for the difference, we can just do each derivative on its own. So f prime of 3 minus g prime of 3. Down here, we're going to have f of 3 minus g of 3, and then squared. So from here, it's just plug it in, but there's a lot of numbers to plug in. You're going to get 4 minus 2 times negative 6. Subtract 4 times negative 6, subtract 5, over 4 minus 2 squared. So this is a good chance for you to practice your arithmetic again. You're going to get a 2 times negative 6 minus 4 times negative 11 over 2 squared. That's going to give negative 12 plus 44 over 4, which is going to give well, 32 over 4, which is simply 8. And so your final answer is 8. Now before we finish, we're going to look at a couple multiple choice questions. Here you want to find the derivative of x to the 4 times 5x squared plus 5. So go ahead and pause the video and give it a try. All right, so we have to use the product rule. Derivative of the first, which will be 4x cubed. Leave the second alone. Derivative of the second one, which is this one, and the first one gets left alone, so the answer is d. Go ahead and pause the video and try the quotient rule on this question. All right, you should end up with C as your answer. Low d high, less high d low, or the denominator squared, we go. Let's try to calculate y double prime. There's, there's two primes. What does that symbol mean? Well, it means the second, or you could think of it as the double derivative. 
it's really the derivative of the derivative. So do the derivative once, and then do the derivative again. I'll leave you in a bit of suspense. We'll come back to this multiple choice question in the next video when we look at actual double derivatives, but give it a guess for now. So for your homework, you can look at the rest of the product and quotient rule worksheet, also page 188, 3 to 25, 31 to 34, and 43. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, and as always, thanks for watching.